Okay, so let us uh, come back to where we left off yesterday. Uh, so we we're having a look at this sutta called the Maha Nama Sutta, which is talking about how to uh, give rise to joy and happiness and eventually samadhi just by reflecting on the Buddha Dhamma Sangha in the right way. Uh, and of course these things are not, not easy, it doesn't happen kind of automatically. Uh, and uh, it takes a bit of training and the closer you get to the Dhamma, the more everything kind of comes together, the more easy it is to give rise to this kind of joy. I'm not going to look at the last three, there's another three ways that is talked about here, how to give rise to the right kind of joy, and these are also very important aspects of Dhamma that I, it's good to reflect on. I've talked about these things here before. One of them is the recollection of virtue. Uh, yeah, you think back on your uh, your practice of morality and you feel a sense of happiness that you are living a good life. You feel good about yourself. You don't feel a big ego or, you know, yeah, I'm the best and best or whatever, <laughs> anything like that. I'm the humblest. Like we like to joke in the monks, I'm the humblest. Yeah, I'm really humble. Uh, and that sort of thing is, uh, <laughs> is kind of counterproductive. Uh, so it's more about uh, uh, just feeling a kind of quiet inner joy by the fact that you live a life well. And this is automatic in many ways. You don't actually have to force it. Uh, yeah? If you live well, you will have a sense of joy inside normally. You will, the defilements will be less. Uh, so it is in one sense it's automatic, but in another sense you can also bring up this joy by sometimes by dwelling on the things that you have done well, just by allowing the mind to uh, you know, to kind of go to that area, whatever. Uh, and the same thing with generosity. Generosity is obviously very closely connected with sila. You just uh, think of something you have done or just generally living a life with an open heart. The idea, of course, in the end is just to have this kind of open-heartedness uh, whereby you always kind of, you help it, willing to help out, you want to kind of, you know, support other people or whatever. Uh, the heart is just open to the world. Uh, and that is the kind of the idea here. And to go all the way to the end of the path, it is specifically said to enter deep samadhi or to become a stream enter. Uh, you have to have this quality of being having a very open heart and being willing to uh, wanting to give it to the whole world, so to speak. Yeah. This is one of the qualities of the stream enter and one of the qualities for entering samadhi. So this is another thing you can see if someone is very always willing to give, always willing to kind of do something, then they are closer to the Dhamma in a sense uh, because of that. Uh. So these are again another way of giving rise to joy and then ultimately samadhi uh, this way. Uh. So you can see how all the various aspects of the Dhamma, they tie together, yeah, the why we are virtuous, there's a very good reason for that and this is where you start to see that reason coming through. Uh. And then you have the last one, which is kind of an interesting one. Is, is this the Devanusati? Huh? Yeah, it's the sixth one of these things in the Mahanama Sutta. And this is where you re recall the Devas. Uh. So that first of all, you have to th believe there are Devas. Uh. If you don't believe there are Devas, well then you, you can't do this one. Huh? So, uh, but uh, if you kind of have some idea that there might be Devas, uh, and uh, sometimes you see kind of, it's not that hard to see Devas sometimes, sometimes you see Devas among human beings. Uh, yeah? You see kind of deva human beings. It's true, isn't it? Some people are really nice. And, uh, so you get this feeling that there are such beings in the world who are special and very uh, and unique. Yeah. And uh, the way this recollection works is just to recall that these, uh, especially the higher beings, the real, the real devas, uh, you know, the reason why they get reborn there is exactly because they practice the way you are doing. Yeah, you are practicing the five precepts, you are living well. Uh, so you are doing the same thing for which those re devas got reborn in that higher realm. And this is also a, a way of creating a bit of joy and happiness. You get this feeling that you're on the right track, you're doing something worthwhile. Uh. So I'm not going to go into those more deeply, but please have a read of them. They're very, they're very nice and very useful uh, and something that most of us can, uh, can do to some extent at least. Uh. Uh, so I'm going to stop there talking about the five uh, indriyas. Uh, I'm just going to say one more thing about the five indriyas. Uh, I have shown you now, in a sense, how you start off, off with faith uh, and how that faith then leads to virya, to the energy, leads to sati, uh, mindfulness, then leads to samadhi, and then eventually leads to wisdom. Yeah, we've kind of seen that process, how it works out. Uh, but how do, you get, how do you get faith? Yeah, how do, you, how do you increase your faith? It may not be so obvious. Uh, and uh, the answer to that, of course, also found in the suttas. Everything is found in the suttas. Uh, and how to get faith? Uh, and this is explained in the sutta that I t 
talk to about here maybe last year or a couple of years ago. Huh? And this is the sutta which shows you the causal process that starts from the very beginning and takes you all the way to awakening. There's many types of causal processes that show you how awakening arises, uh, but this is uh, one that is uh, maybe not so often taught. And this starts off with the Kalyanamitta. Huh? Yeah, this is the very beginning here. Huh? And of course, the main Kalyanamitta on the Buddhist path is the Buddha. Huh? Yeah, the Buddha is kind of our main spiritual friend because uh, he is the one who started all of this. Uh, and but not just the Buddha. Kalyanamittas are also anyone who is an Arya. I think there it doesn't say Kalyanamitta. I think in that sutta it says the Sapurisa. Sapurisa is often translated as the true person. Yeah, or uh, in other words, it is a. A, a synonym for the Arya, the, the Saparisa, someone who has understood the Dhamma. So anyone who has understood the Dhamma has the ability to uh, give you that right view. Huh? Yeah, but the Buddha being the foremost example of that. And when you uh, kind of hang out with the noble ones, uh, when you st when you read, when you listen to what they have to say, then you hear the Sa Dhamma. The Sa Dhamma is the real Dhamma. In other words, the Dhamma that accords with the reality and the way things are. Huh? And when you hear that, uh, Faith arises. Uh, is that right? Uh, may, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, this is kind of the strange thing. Yeah? Sometimes you, you hear the Sadhamma, sometimes you say, wow, this is really good. Uh, sometimes you think, I don't like this, this is rubbish, and you go, you go in a different direction. It, you know, that depends on so many other things as well, so many other faculties uh, that actually depend on whether faith arises. But the only way to give rise to proper faith is this way. Hearing, seeing the Aryas, uh, and then listening to the Sadhamma, and then uh, you get faith in the Buddhist teaching, if you are ready for it. Uh. So this is how faith arises, and, um, uh, and of course this faith, then, uh, it takes a long time for it to really get established. Sometimes we have to hear the suttas again and again. Uh. It's weird, I kind of, you know, I, re I read that some of the suttas I've been reading out here. I've been reading it out for almost every retreat I teach. And I teach a lot of retreats these days uh, of a similar kind because these type of retreats are very popular. Uh, yeah, going to the suttas and wherever I go, they are very popular. I treat, teach exactly the same suttas in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in Sri Lanka, in, in everywhere pretty much, in Europe, uh, wherever I go. Uh, and every time I read them, I feel kind of inspired by these teachings. Every time they kind of hit something slightly different perhaps inside of you. Uh, and this is the thing about these teachings, you kind of, it, it's a gradual process by which you internalize them. Uh, and then faith and confidence increases as a consequence. Uh, and especially when you see it has an impact on your own life, that it actually changes your life, uh, then of course uh, that really makes a big difference. Uh. And then according to this sutta, the consequence of having faith uh, is that you have yoniso manasikara. You know this term, Yoniso Manasikara, is an important Buddhist term, uh, yeah, and it means something like, Manasikara means attention, uh, and Yoniso means something like wise or proper, appropriate, suitable attention. Often translated as wise, but proper is also quite nice. Uh, and Yoniso Manasikara means that whenever you have Yoniso Manasikara, then you are practicing the path, you're on the right track, you're increasing in the wholesome states, declining in the unwholesome ones. Uh, that's kind of an easy way of thinking about Yoniso Manasikara, and that is how it is defined in the second sutta of the middling sayings, the Sabhasava Sutta on all the defilements. That is how it is defined there. It is whenever you are kind of heading in the right direction. Her improper attention is when you're heading away. Yeah, from the Dhamma, when you're kind of increasing in anger and declining in mindfulness and good states, becoming a slightly more nasty person. <laughs> if that's what happens, then you are kind of, it's Ayonis or Manasikara if that happens. Uh, and sometimes that happens to all of us. We're not always on the path. Uh. But it's interesting because Yonis or Manasikara is really an aspect of wisdom. Uh, knowing where to attend, uh, yeah, knowing what is uh, appropriate uh, to actually go with the path. Uh, and it comes from faith. Uh. So again, you see this idea that wisdom and faith are so closely related in Buddhism. And the reason why it comes from faith is because initially we don't really know what we're doing. Uh, we're kind of fumbling around, so we need some kind of support. We need the eye of the world uh, to kind of point us in the right direction. So f in this case, faith and wisdom are, are very closely related. We assume that these teachings are wise and we act accordingly. Uh, and we're kind of acting wisely without really fully knowing what we're doing. Uh, and then gradually, as the path 
comes into place, uh, this wisdom, this initial faith starts to become our own. You start to see how this works. Uh, you start to see why the defilements arise, why they are problematic, why they are suffering, and then you start to move in a different direction. So y that faith becomes more and more wisdom, uh, yeah, and eventually, uh, you know, you go all the way to the end of the path. Uh, so that is where faith comes from. It comes from reading the sutta. So why is it? Uh, actually, before I say that, I should say uh, Kalyanamitta is then one of the very root things uh, that make everything else possible. Uh, there are a few other things in the suttas that are said to be at the very root, uh, at the very starting point. One is Appamada, yeah, which is often translated as heedfulness or diligence or carefulness or circumspection or something like that. Uh, the idea that you, ha you are kind of aware, you're careful about how you live your life. You think, you reflect, you don't you just follow with the stream and the, these kind of things. Uh, so apamada is at the very root. If you are pamada, if you are negligent and uh, heedless, then of course there's no chance you will even get started with anything because you don't really understand the importance of wisdom or anything like that. Uh, and a lot of people in the world are like that, unfortunately. Yeah. And then another uh, a uh, thing that stands at the very root is yoniso manasikara, wise attention. Huh? Yeah, because you need some degree of wise attention to be able to appreciate the Buddhist teachings, huh? otherwise you won't appreciate them. Huh? Samaditi is another one that stands at the very root. You have to have some degree of right view. Huh? If your views are all over the place, again, you won't be able to appreciate what is going on. Huh? And all of these are really aspects of the same thing, yeah? Kalyana Mitta, right view, Yoniso Manasikara, Apamada. It's all about, you have already some inbuilt wisdom in you that you know where to look, you know what to do. Huh? Yeah, this is kind of the root thing that is required. And then uh, there is a chance that you will listen to the Buddha when the Buddha comes along. Uh, otherwise you will be like Upaka. And when the Buddha says, yeah, I, you know, I've just seen the truth, you will kind of shake your head and you will kind of go off in the wrong direction. Remember Upaka at the very beginning uh, of the retreat? Yeah? So you will have that same problem. Uh. So why is it that some people grasp a teaching while others don't? Uh, and this is just our conditioning from the past. Yeah, We have come from a deep past uh, and these conditions, either they come together in a good way so that you have the degree of right view, you have a degree of uh, uh, heedfulness, uh, you have a degree of yonis or manasikara already. So you n go to the right spiritual friends uh, yeah, and then it happens. It's almost like we're lucky, Yeah, we have been conditioned in the right way. Uh. Somehow the conditions come together and that's why we are here and we are practicing these teachings. Uh. Whereas other people who haven't got that conditioning, uh, they hear the Dhamma and they become like Upaka, they shake their head and go off in the wrong direction. And this is, uh, this is the problem. Uh. So it seems, is it unfair? Well, I don't know if it's unfair, it's just the way nature works. Yeah? You can't really say it's fair or unfair, just the way things are. And, uh, and but, but it is problematic. Yeah? And one thing that it should do when you reflect on reality like that is to understand how uncertain everything is. Uh, you don't know where you're going to be conditioned in the future. Uh, you don't know in the future whether you will be interested in Buddhism even. Uh, yeah, I, Maitreya comes around, uh, finally another Buddha. Yeah, I've been waiting for this Buddha. You've been praying to Maitreya, please come and save me. I don't know, I can't do this by myself. Uh, and then when Maitreya comes, uh, you are so deluded and you're so all the place, you kind of dismiss him like Upaka. Okay, go, don't, not interested, I want to go this path instead. Uh, this is what happens, yeah? We just, we don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, we don't know if our spiritual faculties are going to go up or decline. Uh, and this is kind of the slightly worrying things about this, uh, because without that you are kind of lost in this sea called samsara with no discernible exit, uh, and you're just going to go on suffering. Uh. So what that does to you is it gives you a little bit of urgency. It shouldn't make you kind of you know, paralyzed with fear. If it makes you paralyzed with fear, you have taken the, this kind of contemplation too far. Uh. But it should give you a little bit of sense of urgency that actually there's something important to be done here uh, because uh, you just have no idea what's going to happen to you next. Uh. So now you have the Kalyanamitta, now we have the word of the Buddha, and that is what, what this is all about. Uh. So there you are, five spiritual faculties, uh, Panch Indriya, uh, explained in a bit of detail. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense to you. Uh. And uh, hope, yeah, so uh, uh, now what I would like to do is to have a very quick look at the Pancha Bala. So if you go to page 112 in the little booklet, uh, the five spiritual powers. Uh, 
And uh, this is not not all that interesting, but I'll I'll read it anyway. <laughs> so um, uh, this sutta is just to point out what I was saying before that the difference between the five faculties and the five balas, uh, five indriyas and the five balas, is actually very small, and it's so small that it is. Uh, I don't know if it is really necessary to make any distinction between the two. So this particular sutta on page 112 is called Saketa. Uh, Saketa was one of the six great cities in ancient India. It was found in the um, uh, Korsalan kingdom. Uh, so this is where the Buddha would have stayed a lot in this particular area. And this is one of the rare suttas that comes from this particular place. And uh, this is how it goes. So I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying near Saketa in the deer park at the Anjana wood. There the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants, uh, is there a way in which the five faculties uh, become the five powers uh, and the five powers become the five faculties? Uh, and then the monks reply, our teachings are rooted in the Buddha. He is our guide and refuge. Sir, may the Buddha himself please clarify the meaning of this. Uh, the mendicants would listen and remember it. Uh, this is a standard passage when the when the Buddha is kind of asking the monks. They, they don't they don't usually answer. They kind of just okay, please you you tell us what this is about. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, mendicants, there are this there is a way in which the five faculties become the five powers, and the five powers become the five faculties. Uh, and what is that method? Uh, the faculty of faith is the power of faith, and the power of faith is the faculty of faith. The faculty of energy is the power of energy, and the power of energy is the faculty of energy. The faculty of mindfulness is the power of mindfulness, and the power of mindfulness is the faculty of mindfulness. The faculty of immersion is the power of immersion, and the power of immersion is the faculty of immersion. The faculty of wisdom is the power of wisdom, and the power of wisdom is the faculty of wisdom. So, uh, so I said it's not not o perhaps all that interesting, but anyway, y there, there you are. It's it's a kind of a <laughs> and then comes the little si simile, which actually is quite nice because it gives you some uh, a better understanding, perhaps. Uh, suppose that there were a river, slanting, sloping, and inclining to the east. In other words, the river goes from west to east. Uh, yeah, w which river do you think that is? Uh? Exactly. Yeah, it's an obvious river, yeah, because that goes from west to east, and it is the one river that everyone knows about in ancient India, especially if you live in Saketa, which is might have been on the actual ba banks of the river Ganges. So. Um, uh, and inclining to this, and the in the middle there was an island. Yeah, the Ganges is an enormous river. I don't know if you have traverse the Ganges uh, at, at the Patna and you've gone across, it's absolutely humongous. Uh, the, the, the several kilometers as to get across this river. Yeah. There is a way in which that river can be reckoned uh, to have just one stream, but there's also a way in which that river can be reckoned to have two streams. Uh, and what is the way in which that river can be reckoned to have just one stream? Uh, by taking into account the water to the east and west of the island, that river can be reckoned to have just one stream. And what is the way in which the river can be reckoned to have two streams? By taking into account the water to the north and south of the island, that river can be reckoned to have two streams. Yeah, so uh, it is really the same river, but because the island is the in the middle, it splits the river into two. Uh, and so the, the river on the north is called Bala, the river on the south is called uh, Indrias, uh, but they come from the same source and they move on uh, to the same destination afterwards. Uh, they are basically the same, but uh, if you look at them from different angles, uh, from different points of va vantage points, uh, they will look slightly different. Uh, so uh, I think the best understanding of ballas and indriyas uh, is just that they are uh, slightly different angles from which to understand the same thing. One is a power and one is a faculty. What is the difference between these words in English? I don't know. I'm not sure what the, <laughs> what the difference is. Uh, the meaning is very close. Uh, yeah? It is one maybe, f one maybe f focuses a bit on uh, uh, a certain ability. Yeah? A faculty is like an ability. It also means like power, but you have the uh, ability which is uh, something which uh, overrides the other things. Uh, and bala is a power, something which is a force in the mind. Uh, yeah? Something like that, but it's it, the, the difference is so small, I wouldn't even worry about it uh, if I were you. Uh. 
So that is the balas. So that is another five of the set of 37 bodhipakya dhammas. Yeah, that means that because they are similar to uh, the indriyas, that means that we can almost subtract five and make them into 32. Uh, yeah, so you have five less to remember. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, if you keep on remembering them as sets, they're not so hard to uh, remember, as you mentioned before, yeah, because the sets are quite uh, obvious. We know the Eightfold Path, the Seven Factors of Awakening, and straight away it becomes more clear. Uh. Okay, so there you are, five indriyas, uh, uh, five faculties, five balas, five powers. Uh, and now I would like to have a look at the seven awakening factors, uh, or factors of awakening. Uh, uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, these come really towards the very end of the path. Uh, but I would like to have to look at them now, because uh, I want to finish off with the eightfold path tomorrow. Uh, uh, see, see, I'm not sure exactly how the progress is going to be, but something like that. Uh, and so I would like to have a look at the other sets before I come to the Noble Eightfold Path. So that's why I like to have a look at these now, even though they are very high, you know, these very kind of, they come at the very, very end. And if you look at the uh, seven factors of awakening, uh, what you see about them, the very first one is the Sati Sambhujanga. So this is the factor of awakening, which is mindfulness. So we're already on the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and then all of these factors, they end up with upeka. And upeka is the, the uh, uh, means, in the highest sense, it means the fourth jhana, where you reach the highest sense of equanimity and upeka. So this is starting at mindfulness, taking you to the fourth jhana. So uh, it's already, already you cannot do in the breath meditation, uh, and then all the way to the fourth jhana. So, uh, you may perhaps feel that you are kind of just a beginner as far as these things are concerned, but that's okay. I like to, it's good to have the map in your mind, uh, yeah, and have some idea. It can be very inspiring. Uh, I, it's very important to have that inspiration as well. Uh, and this is one of the things that the higher dhammas give you. They give you a feeling of, this is really worthwhile. Uh, and not only is it worthwhile, but it can be done. Uh, yeah, with the right approach, with the kind of the, the teachings of the Buddha, and with the commitment and perseverance on the path to do these things, uh, it can be done. And this is kind of the point. Uh, so let's have a look at these. And the first sutta here is called a monk, or a bhikkhu. And uh, uh, it uh, goes as follows. And this is just like a, uh, understanding the meaning of what f awakening factor actually means. Uh, at Savati. Then uh, a mendicant, a monk, went up to the Buddha and said to him, Sir, they speak of awakening factors. Uh, how are the awakening factors defined? So what, what are these awakening factors? Uh, um, and uh, Just having a quick look at the... Uh, what is happening here? Oh, what's happening here? I've lost, the suit, lost that suit, I think. Yeah. Okay, one suit has disappeared. Okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I had them all available. No, never mind. So, uh, uh, how are what are they? What are the, how are they defined? Uh, and uh, the Buddha replies, Bhikkhu, they are called awakening factors because they lead to awakening here. Yeah. yeah, so this is uh, obviously an important thing, some, because sometimes you wonder wha why do they have a certain name? Awakening factors could have meant the factors or the aspects of awakening itself, uh, yeah, what awakening consists of, if you like. Uh, it could have meant that, uh, but no, that means the things that lead to awakening. Yeah. And again, this is very fascinating, because if you look at the awakening factors, as I said, they all start with Satipatthana practice, mindfulness of breathing, and then all have to do with this sequence of uh, that lead up to samadhi, yeah, the joy, the tranquility, and all of that, ending up with the fourth jhana. So it tells you that, again, this a very close connection between awakening and the jhanas. Uh, and this is what you see throughout the suttas. Uh, jhanas are like the step before awakening. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it's important not to underestimate what the jhanas are. Uh, these are very profound states. Uh, if they're going to take you to awakening, it can't just be jhana light. It's got to be jhana profound. It's got to be the real jhanas. Uh, if you uh, misunderstand the nature of the jhanas, uh, you're not going to be able to reach awakening. Uh, if you have a bit of joy, yeah, it's very easy to get these things wrong because uh, as the meditation 
becomes deeper and you start looking at your mind and you have read the suttas, you know there's supposed to be five jhana factors, uh, yeah, these five, and then you look into your mind and say, yeah, I'm feeling joy, happy, yeah, I'm feeling happy. Uh, vitaka vichara, the mind is kind of fairly concentrated but moving a little bit, so that's probably vitaka vichara. And it's very easy to read these things uh, into your um, experience, uh, but you have to be careful to remember these are very high experiences. It's not just any type of five jhana factors, it is the jhana factors in a certain certain type of configuration, and only then is it called jhanas. And it is a, this is a big problem, because uh, as far as I can see, the vast majority of people around the world uh, have a tendency to underestimate the jhanas, and the reason for that is because people want to have the jhanas. Uh, yeah, I want these jhanas. Uh, and because you want them, and because they are important, uh, then you will read the th these things into this experience. Uh. So this, um, this is a very, this is a very important point, uh, and uh, uh, and sometimes difficult to get around. Once people kind of get their mind on something, uh, it's very hard to kind of to to change. But anyway, so this is uh, so there are factors that lead to awakening, and uh, this is the things you have to do if you want to awaken her, and it ends with the fourth jhana. So and then the Buddha explains this in a little bit more detail. Uh, a mendicant develops the awakening factor of mindfulness, uh, the awakening factor of uh, investigation of principles. Uh, this is Ajahn Sujato's translation. The awakening factor of energy, uh, the awakening factor of rapture or joy perhaps, uh, the awakening factor of tranquility, the awakening factor of immersion, of stillness, uh, of samadhi, uh, the awakening factor of equanimity, or if you like, evenness of mind. The mind is even. Uh, the mind is just standing back and watching. Uh, which rely on seclusion, on fading away, uh, on cessation, uh, and ripens in letting go. Uh. So this, uh, these are the seven awakening factors. And... Uh, um, so... Um, we should, maybe this is probably the right time to have a look at these factors in a little bit more depth because um, uh, it is, uh, obviously we need to know a little bit about what these are, these various factors. Uh, so let us have a look at these ones in sequence and we can define them a little bit, what they actually mean, because uh, uh, it is not that hard because we have looked at most of these already, so it should be fairly straightforward. But let's start with the awakening factor of mindfulness. Uh, and uh, if you think back to the Anapanasati Sutta, I didn't read out the whole Sutta, but what that Sutta says is that you are, when you practice Anapanasati and you do it fully, uh, then you fulfill the four Satipatthanas. Yeah? All you have to do is watch the breath, you fulfill the four Satipatthanas. Uh, when you fulfill the four Satipatthanas, uh, which is mindfulness, yeah, mindfulness meditation, when you fulfill that, uh, you fulfill the seven factors of awakening, yeah? So these, all of these things are very closely connected to each other. Uh. So from that, when the suttas talk about the mindfulness factor of awakening, uh, it really starts off with Satipatthana practice. Uh. That is kind of the initial point. Uh. Yeah, so you start with Satipatthana practice, and this could mean simply watching the breath. Uh. And by watching the breath properly, when it starts to work, uh, then you are already moving into the seven factors of awakening. This is where they start, yeah? When you are kind of at ease, at peace, watching the breath, and you are mindful, not too much thinking going on. Uh. That's already quite a nice state. Uh. And then that leads on to this, what is here called the investigation of principles, or investigation of dhammas. Dhamma vichaya sambhujanga uh, is the Pali, Pali word for this. Uh. And uh, if you the, the way this is defined in the Bhujangas, it is defined as knowing uh, the wholesome state, the unwholesome states, uh, the bright states, the uh, dark states of mind, uh, the blameworthy states and the blameless states. Uh, yeah? So it is, in other words, it is defined as your ability to sort out the defilements from the pure, pure ideas, the pure uh, aspects of mind. That's really what it means. Uh, 
And if you think about the way Satipatthana works, that is a very large part of Satipatthana practice or mindfulness of breathing is precisely about that. Uh, is the distinction between the, the wholesome qualities on the one hand and the unwholesome qualities on the other hand. Uh, especially when you come to the last Satipatthana, which is about understanding the hindrances in detail. Uh, I mentioned this before, understanding what they are, how they come about and all of this, uh, how to abandon them. Uh, there's a very close connection again with the last part of the Satipatthana Sutta and the investigation of Dhammas or investigation of principles. Uh. So the first two Bhojangas are very closely related to Satipatthana practice. Uh. They are watching the breath, understanding the defilements and in detail and then overcoming them. Uh. So this is one way of looking at this. And uh, remember, uh, again, and I will show you this later on, there is a connection here between these bojangas. Uh, it is not a random set of seven factors. Uh, they are connect causally connected to each other, just like in the Satipatthana. So first of all, you start with watching the breath. Uh, you've already put in the groundwork to be able to do that. Uh, and then the consequence of that uh, is that it enables you then to investigate the fine defilements that are left in the mind. Uh, Dhamma Sambhojanga leads to the Dhamma Vichaya Sambhojanga. You start with mindfulness and then that mindfulness investigates the last remaining problems in the mind, Dhamma Vichaya. And then through that mindfulness and the abandoning of the last defilements, your mind gets purified and then it leads to the ne next Bhojanga, which is the Virya. The energy comes because when the defilements are low, the mind becomes energetic. You get rid of that tiredness or sluggishness of mind and then the Piti comes and all of that. So again, it is a sequence, a cause sequence, one thing leading to the next one. Huh? So this is uh, one way of thinking about the Bojangas. It's not the only way. Huh? Uh, another way, and this is mentioned, and we'll have a look at that later on, is mentioned specifically in the suttas, uh, and that is that the Sati Sambhojanga is just what we have been looking at before. It is a recollection, for example, of a particular teaching. Uh, yeah, and the, the case which we will look at later on is that you hear a good teaching, uh, yeah, or you read a nice teaching, uh, and then by reflecting on that teaching, uh, that in, in itself is then the sati, first of all remembering teaching, then reflecting and considering it is the dhammavichya sambhojanga, uh, and then because you are reflecting on the teaching in the right way, it has to be the right way, it has to be in a deep way, uh, then the energy and the joy happen as a consequence. Uh. So simply by uh, reflecting on the teaching in a purposeful way, hearing these things, uh, uh, these things actually come about as a consequence. Uh, this is very similar to what we were looking at before when the Buddha talks about uh, Dhamma Nusati and Buddha Nusati. Uh, when you are doing the Buddha Nusati in the right way, you are actually reflecting on the Buddha's teachings. Yeah, this is a Buddha's teaching. Itipiso Bhagava, Arahang Samma Sambuddho Vijja Charana Sampanno. All of that is part of the Buddha's teachings. You are actually using the Buddha's teachings, uh, but also the qualities of the Buddha to give rise to joy. Uh. Same thing with the Dhamma Nupassana, uh, Dhamma Nusati. I'm getting confused here. Uh, <laughs> Dhamma Nusati, again, that is also a teaching of the Buddha. So you reflect on that, and that when you understand the, what you actually have, what we have received from the Buddha. The, uh, the, the teachings that you know take you all the way to the end of suffering and all of this. Actually, the more you understand what this really is about, uh, the more kind of pr the, the more it lifts you up, the more inspired you feel because you understand there's something very profound and very beautiful and remarkable going on with these teachings. Uh, and this is really the right attitude to have to this. Uh, so that is a uh, uh, yeah. And then uh, uh, the Sangha Nusati as well is also kind of. Part of c can also be part of this, but maybe not so much here. But that also is a teaching of the Buddha. So any teaching, but especially those teachings that are uh, contemplations on these things, uh, are things that can give rise to all of these things. You investigate them, yeah, and this shows you in part the importance uh, of investigating the teachings, uh, of reflecting on them to try to understand what they are in a deeper sense, uh, and not just kind of uh, breeze through them in a superficial way. Because if you do that, then they won't have the same impact on you. Huh? And then, whoa, you get uplifted uh, and then you kind of it carries you carries you on. Uh. So this is two of the ways of thinking about the Bojangas. But uh, really, I think it is fair to say that any kind of mindfulness uh, that is supported by right view in one way or another uh, is the Satisambojanga. Uh. 
So when we have mindfulness supported by right view, it has to be sorted by right, right view. It can't be the mindfulness that you have from eating a nice mango. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe, but at least it, it maybe can be if you eat it with mindfulness. But when there's a nice mango, it's difficult to retain your mindfulness. You kind of get absorbed into the mango. You become that mango, if you know what I mean. Uh, bang is. <laughs> so, uh, and that, of course, is not the. Uh, this, that's not the kind of mi mindfulness we want. We want to have the mindfulness that stands back from the mango. Yeah, the mango is there. I'm over here, and you understand the difference. Uh, so you can enjoy the taste, uh, but you don't allow yourself to get uh, absorbed, kind of completely heedless, intoxicated by the taste. Uh, it is a. There's a matter of uh, of having standing back there. Uh. So. Um, uh, so that is, I think, the kind of in the end, that is a wonder, nice way of thinking about the Satisambhojangva. Any kind of mindfulness based on Buddhism, based on right view, based on the right kind of practice, uh, that is Satisambhojangva. And then, uh, kind of the abandoning of the hindrance through using that reflection or, or thought or, or whatever it is, uh, and then the, uh, whatever joy arises from that. Uh, and uh, we have seen before many ways of doing that, the reflection on the sila, the chaga, or, or whatever meditation object you do, metta, karuna, all of these things are acceptable and fall within the scope of the sati sambhujanga here. So it's qu it can be quite broad, yeah? And uh <coughs> which is good because we need little, different little techniques to make this work, yeah? So, uh, Mindfulness arises, you investigate what is going on, then the energy comes, yeah, the energy comes because the hindrances go down and you will notice that uh, when the mind is more pure, uh, you have more energy. The more purity you have in the mind, the more energy you have as a consequence. Uh, and that then the, so the energy arises and the energy of course gives you even more scope for investigating and understanding because your mind becomes clear, you have, you, have, you have that power behind you to be able to investigate more deeply. Uh, and then that takes you to, uh, the PT starts to arise, you're watching the object of the, med of the meditation uh, and the, all the joy in the world starts to arise inside of you. Still relatively <laughs> course and yet very already at this point it is already very beautiful and very uh, very enjoyable uh, yeah even much more so than just being with the breath uh, becoming very very enjoyable at this point uh, and then from that pity as you keep on going things calm down now you, you remember the way you're doing this is that you're watching the breath yeah for example or whatever it is ideally probably watching the breath at this particular point uh, and then things start to calm down become incredibly tranquil uh, as I mentioned before, when we're doing the meditation read on the first day, there comes a point when you feel so still, so solid, uh, you don't want to do anything else in the whole world but just sit here. Uh, you want to sit here until the rest of eternity. Uh. <laughs> but it's not going to happen, yeah, that's the problem, because eventually the restlessness comes back and says, okay, move, yeah, it's like the slave driver whips you on the back, okay, now you had enough rest, uh, enough holiday. And you start to feel, yeah, maybe you're right, I should be doing things, yeah, there's all the things, you feel a bit guilty about not having done this or that, and then you kind of get off and you start doing things again. Huh? And this is the problem, you can't sit there for eternity. Huh? So, and, but then that tranquility still is a very, very beautiful uh, state of mind, and if you're able to uh, stay with it for long enough, it's a very subtle and beautiful kind of happiness that comes with that. Uh, and that draws you in very powerfully. You're not able to uh, be restless anymore because the power of the of the situation and the beauty of what is happening it get drawn in uh, and that is what sa when samadhi happens as a consequence yeah it's like your mind becomes laser focused on this thing yeah you stay with the object and then samadhi happens uh. and uh, the uh, the deeper that samadhi is uh, the more powerful it is and of course we try we continue practicing the samadhi until eventually you reach things like the fourth jhana and uh, Fourth jhana is where you have the upeka, the evenness of mind, the equanimity, uh, and uh, that this is why the kind of fourth jhana is so powerful, uh, because you have gone beyond good feelings, negative feelings, positive feelings, uh, all beyond that, all you have left is neutral feeling, uh, and it sounds boring, doesn't it? Neutral feeling? I don't want. I want happy feelings. I don't want all these neutral feelings, uh, and this is kind of the. This is one of those things that I always like to point out, what is so astonishing about this path. Uh, neutral feeling is better than happy feeling here. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to kind of grasp, isn't it? You, the only way you can really grasp this is through experience. Uh, 
because but the point is that actually it is more subtle it is more powerful it is it is preferable uh, it's very hard to understand this is one of the things that makes the buddhist teaching so a little bit unfathomable and you realize the only way to really understand this uh, is you have to experience it by yourself for yourself uh, the third jhana is the highest happiness that's possible in the universe yeah it's impossible to have more happiness than this uh, in terms of a felt experience uh, and then you go altogether beyond happiness uh, and when you go all beyond happiness you feel even more happy yeah. when you go beyond happiness you feel more happy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's paradoxical, isn't it? But this is kind of the point, because happiness is not just in happy feelings. Uh, happiness is anywhere it can be found. So if neutral feeling is more happy than happy feeling, it's more, maybe happy is the wrong word, it's more satisfying, uh, more um, uh, meaningful, uh, then you go for the neutral feeling here. Yeah. So this is what happens. This is when you reach the fourth jhana, and that is where the mind is perfectly poised for insight. So from the first jhana, that's where you recall your past lives. Uh, fourth jhana, recall your past lives. Uh, this is where you see everything, and this is where you kind of make the final breakthrough. Uh, so you keep on fulfilling that, uh, and it happens o pretty much automatically once you get to that point. Uh. So this is the, uh, these are the seven factors of awakening, and you will notice how similar they are to so many of the other things that we have talked about already. Uh, on this retreat, there's a slightly different angle on very many of the same principles, uh, dependent liberation, the mindfulness of breathing, all of these really point towards the same thing, the same kind of process going on. Uh, it is reinforced from different angles, and every time you hear about it, it's a slightly different angle, and this is what kind of, um, after a while, you start to get the, the broader picture. Uh, and then it says that um, it relies on seclusion fading away and cessation. Uh, and so what this means, because this is a profound uh, uh, medita meditation, meditation process that we're seeing here, uh, you have to be secluded for this really to work. So it relies on seclusion, and again remember, seclusion is considered usually twofold. Uh, uh, the physical seclusion, the seclusion of the body, kaya viveka, where you kind of uh, get yourself off into a kuti somewhere or into a nice retreat center in the forest or something like that. Uh, so you have some seclusion. This is the first one. Uh, and because the body, you are physically secluded from the world uh, and from uh, all the distractions of the world and all the pleasures of the world, then gradually the mind also moves into the same direction. Uh. So uh, uh, this is kind of the, the mind that dries out of those uh, pleasures of the world uh, and it kind of... Uh, uh, I, you start to incline in a different direction. This is the power of living in the forest, uh, or ideally the power. So you have the citta kaya viveka, the citta viveka. So this is the difficulty we're living in the city as a monastic. Yeah, you're always surrounded by. You don't have that seclusion, uh, and because you have that sec don't have that seclusion, you're not supported by that, and that makes it much more difficult for a monastic who lives in a city or a town to achieve the same kind of uh, meditation progress. Uh, you're always around all the pleasures in the world, everything is always around, you get reminded by all of these things, uh, and you have all the distractions and everything, uh, yeah? And uh, so it's not ideal, in fact, that uh, this, uh, and, and this is why you, sometimes we shouldn't really expect city monastics to have the same kind of level of meditation as a forest monastic, sometimes we are asking perhaps too much, uh, and sometimes people say, oh, I'm disappointed by these monastics, they're not living properly, but if they are city monastics, it's almost as if they have chosen to live slightly differently. They have chosen to have a life more of service, of teaching Dhamma and all of these kind of things, uh, and not so much of reaching profound states of meditation. And that's okay. Uh, and there may even be some of them who do have good meditation, because people are different. So we can never kind of classify everyone according to absolute categories, uh, but in general, as a general principle, these things are, this, this, these things are true. Uh. So seclusion, is very fundamental on the Buddhist path. And uh, uh, even from the Anapanasati Sutta, yeah, it says uh, at the beginning of the Anapanasati Sutta, it says you, you go off to an empty hut, uh, to the root of a tree, uh, or to, uh, it, it has a number of other things as well, other places in the Sutta. You go off to a mountaintop, or a mountain cleft, or a ravine, and all of these kind of things, or a heap of straw. That's my favorite ones. You go, you f go to a heap of straw, uh, and then you sit down, you do your meditation practice. Palala Punja is the Pali word. Uh, I just want, I, I'm not sure about what that means exactly. Uh, maybe it means you kind of collect lots of straw and then you kind of make a heap and then you sit down on top or something like that. Uh, but, uh, or, or you g go into a farmer's field. Uh, do you have this farmer's field in Malaysia where kind of you have straw bundled up? Uh, 
You, no, I don't have that over here. Okay. Well, we have we have it in, in Australia at least. The farmers they cut the cut at the end of the season. They cut all the straw and they kind of bring in the harvest and they bundle up the straw into this big kind of bundles. Uh, that's cla- that's was, that must be a perfect place for meditation practice. Yeah, heap of straw. That's what it says in the in the suttas. So. Palala punja is the Pali word for heap of straw. Anyway, so this is seclusion, and then based on fading away and cessation, yeah, and this is the idea, what is going on here is that as you go through the process of meditation, we've talked about this already, things start to fade away and they start to disappear. Yeah. And the more things fade away, uh, the more powerful the meditation is going to be, the more powerful this process uh, of the seven factors of awakening is going to be. Uh. So you make the body fade, gradually fade away. Uh. The five senses gradually fade away. The five hindrances are fading away. Uh. The will is fading away as so the mind becomes more and more still. Uh. Certain perceptions and feeling like pain is fading away. All the experience is bliss. Uh. And the more things fade away and ultimately disappear, the more powerful this practice is going to be. Uh. So, th- so you allow things to fade away. And again, the forest is quite good because already a few things have faded away. The perception of the city and the perception of people has already faded away, which is already a, a good thing in the forest. Uh. So this is what this means, uh, because then the samadhi uh, comes from the fading away of things. Uh. And then the last one is that it uh, matures uh, what does it say here? It matures, uh, it ripens, it says here, in letting go. Uh, this is, uh, is this Vosaga? Is that what it is? Vosaga Parinama? Yeah, thank, thank you. <laughs> uh, le- so, Vosaga. So, let me just uh, see if I can get that here. Um, yeah, Vosaga parina- Parinama. Parinama literally means to ripen, it's like a fruit ripens. Uh, and here is we see this word vasagga again. So you were asking about that y- yesterday, yeah. So uh, yeah, so there, there you find it in another similar kind of context where it, where it kind of ends up with uh, giving up completely here. Yeah. So uh, uh, and uh, so vasagga uh, in this case probably has a very profound meaning. It starts off by meaning the vasagga that we saw before, which means just letting go or giving up uh, of the sensual world. Uh, but ultimately it means the letting go or giving up or relinquishment of everything. So it really means here, ultimately, the ending of craving. It's just a synonym for the ending of craving, really, in this particular context. Uh, emptiness, um, fading away. So this, is the, this cup here is, is has already ceased, so I'm going to take the cup which has not ended yet. <coughs> Okay, so then the Buddha goes on uh, and uh, he says, uh, as they develop the seven awakening factors, uh, their mind is freed from the defilement. Defilement here, Pali word is asava, so these are the profound corruptions of the mind at the very root uh, of the p- problem of uh, existence. Uh, the desire to be reborn, which is a nice translation for the bhavasava, usually uh, said to be the, sensu- the defilement or the, uh, inf- sometimes translated as the influx of, of uh, a becoming or existence, which is very hard to understand. The desire to be reborn, really easy to understand, a much better translation. Huh? And the last one is the defilement of uh, ignorance or delusion, the avijja asava. Huh? So uh, this means, as you develop these things, you become an arahant. That's what it's saying. Uh, develop those awakening factors, and bang, arahant you are. Uh. <laughs> when they're freed, they know that they are freed. Uh, yeah, there's no doubt. You know, that's what I was talking about before. Someone asked if you know when you're arahant. Uh, when you are an arahant, you know you're an arahant. Uh, you understand. You know that rebirth is ended. Uh. You may never have even recalled rebirth, uh, past lives in your entire life, uh, and still you know that rebirth is n- has ended. Uh, this is another example of inferential reasoning. Uh, you cannot actually see that you won't be reborn in the future because you can't see what's going to happen directly with your mind's eye, but you know that the causes has, have been destroyed. You understand the process of causality, how it actually works through a direct insight into how craving drives the process forward. So you know inferentially that rebirth must have ended. Is the 
Understanding is just as certain as seeing th- something with your eyes directly. I- inferential doesn't mean that the understanding is any less. Uh, it just means that it's a different way of understanding. For example, if I uh, feel happy because I do something, I know the same thing is true for other people. Even though I cannot feel your experiences, uh, I know it must be true because we are obviously basically the same as human beings. Uh, so infer- inferential understanding is just as powerful as direct experience, uh, at least sometimes. Uh, not always, perhaps, but in this case it is. Uh, the spiritual journey has been completed. Huh? That's quite nice. Yeah, Vusitang Brahmacharyang. Okay, Brahmach- the spiritual life has been lived. Uh, what has to be done, had to be done, has been done. Katang Karaniyang. There is no return to any state of existence. Uh, they are called the awakening factors because they lead to awakening. Huh? So there you are, Brahmacharya is, the, is called here the spiritual life, yeah, or the spiritual journey in this particular particular case. Uh, so just uh, briefly, just to maybe point out here about right, this last thing, what is very interesting th- about this, and uh, one of the kind of very important things to realize, the standard knowledge of the arahant when you become awakened is always rebirth is ended, yeah. There is no return to any state of existence. Uh, and the other things are just saying that you have done your job, you are finished. That's all, it doesn't really add very much. So that is what the spiritual life is about. Yeah, it is about ending rebirth. This is equivalent to the ending of dukkha. And uh, so this is how important it is, the whole purpose of this path, the whole purpose of what really the highest happiness is, the ending of dukkha is, is the ending of rebirth. These are equivalent things. And uh, it shows you the uh, important and how integrated the idea of rebirth is uh, to the Buddhist teachings. Uh, so it's important to realize that because uh, some people think that you can kind of, kind of take out rebirth out of the suttas uh, and it will be the same. Actually, the whole purpose of the Dhamma is changed uh, yeah? if you do that. Uh, it doesn't have the same purpose anymore. Uh, uh, in fact, it doesn't really have much purpose at all uh, if you take out rebirth. The whole thing is fully kind of uh, changed uh, and you have to rewrite from scratch what the Dhamma is about and this is what some of these people do, they write books about what the Dhamma actually means, uh, yeah? this is what it really means and you have to redefine all the terms because rebirth is so integrated into these teachings uh, that if you change its meaning everything changes, the whole Dhamma becomes something else, dependent or origination becomes different, the Four Noble Truths become different, uh, yeah, the ending of the path, like we're seeing here, becomes different. Everything changes, uh, and then you have to rewrite the Dhamma. And what is that new Dhamma? It is no longer Dhamma, it is something else. Uh, it is uh, not the Sad Dhamma, it is the Micha Dhamma. Micha Dhamma, wrong Dhamma, unfortunately. That is what happens when these things uh, do happen. Uh, and uh, sometimes, so you have to be a little bit careful sometimes with the kind of books and Dhamma that is, that is taught in this world, because sometimes uh, it doesn't bear very much relation to the insight of the Buddha. So this is why a degree of confidence and faith is important. Yeah? Things like rebirth, you can't see it, you can't know it, sometimes you are told that it is unscientific, or, although I think that is complete nonsense. Science doesn't have anything to say about these things. Uh, uh, but uh, and for that reason, sometimes you faith and confidence actually do matter. This is what the Buddha said. Uh, well, the Buddha was it seems to be pretty wise. Uh, so okay, let me take it on board at least provisionally. I don't have to say this is absolutely true, but let me take this on board provisionally because it seems to be so fundamental part of what these teachings are about. Uh, anyway, so we are kind of already sidetracking a little bit from the Bojangas. Uh, so let me. Stop there. Let's have a short break and uh, we'll see you back again.